Hi everyone. Um, in this video, we're just going to be going over my practice midterm two, midterm three. Oh God, already off to a great start. Um, yeah, same thing as we did for midterm two. Um, if you note, it's 1 a.m. and I'm on three hours of sleep. So if I start jumbling my words, not my fault. Okay, so. Question one has the diagram to the right will be used to answer questions one through four. The letters Y and Z represent different parts of replication. Okay, so these are parts of our well, ref replication. Um, letters F, G, J, M, and L next to red shape correspond to enzymes. So that means that Y and Z are non-enzymes. And if I look here, Y and Z, they seem to be associated with a different bit Right, if I look at this strand to this strand, right here to here, so I'm making a divide right there, they seem to be different. So that's telling me that this is not the same as whatever is here. Okay, which of the following letters represent the same enzyme? Well, I gotta figure out what enzymes these are. Well, if I do that, I can write five prime here, three prime here, makes this five prime, this three prime, this five prime, this three prime. All right, well, let's see. Enzyme F is catalyzing some strand, a very long strand at that, five prime to three prime. And if we notice, it is going in the same direction as the replication fork, right? The replication fork is, if we were to draw that out, it's moving. Oh gosh, that was terrible. Moving in that direction. This strand is getting five or synthesized five to three in that same direction. That makes this this leading strand, which makes this DNA polymerase. All right. Well, let's see. L seems to be taking this double strand and separating it. So that makes this helicase. Uh, M seems to be doing the same thing as F, except it's going... Once again, still five prime to three prime, but now it's going the opposite direction. And I notice there's a bunch of fragments here. I have multiple primers, so that makes this the lagging strand. I can also know that it's going five to three in the direction opposite of the replication fork. Okay. So that makes M DNA polymerase as well. Okay. And then G seems to be making this larger part here. Well, this larger part is corresponding to a primer. All right? Notice how it's appearing at the very, very end and is what is being built off of. So we know if this guy's DNA polymerase, it must be polymerizing DNA. And so it needed the primers three prime hydroxyl here to get started. So that means Y and Z are primers. And it looks like F and M are DNA polymerase. G is primase. And L is helicase. Okay, so which are the same? F and M. Which of the following enzymes require ATP for their primary function? Well, the primary function of DNA polymerase is to polymerize DNA. Does this require ATP? No, no ATP, right? What it requires is D NTPs, right? So the D NTPs are some nitrogenous base with a lack of a two prime hydroxyl and three phosphate groups. Okay, so anything that has F and M doesn't work. So that one doesn't work, that one doesn't work, that one doesn't work, that one doesn't work. So that only leaves us with C as an answer, but we can go through L helicase does require ATP, right? As it's unsipping the strands, right? You're breaking hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds are stabilizing. So you're making something less stable. You're gonna need an energy source for that. G is primase. And primase requires 
NTPs. And guess what? NT ATP, GTP, UTP, CTP, and technically TTP, although it won't be used. All of these are NTPs. So it's kind of tricky. It's not UT using ATP as just an energy source. It's actually using it as the incoming monomer, right? This incoming substrate for primase. So ATP is required here. And then J, J is corresponding to, oh, it's kind of hidden here, but J is written right underneath there. It's corresponding to here. That should be ligase. Notice how it's taking two strands that have a, or two adjacent strands and a little nick between the two. That's the job of ligase, right? It's healing those nicks. Uh, three, oh God, the section of nucleotides represented by Y was polymerized, polymerized by which enzyme? Well, Y is a primer, which means it was laid down by primase. And we said G was primase. So answer choice G. Answer choice G. Which of the following enzymes catalyze the formation of phosphodiester bonds? That should be primase. Because you're forming a phosphodiester bonds before, but are between the RNA nucleotides and the DNA polymerases. So we should have F, G, and M. But we also have to remember that ligase is as well. Remember when it's sealing that nick, the nick is looking like. Come on. There we go. Okay. That's what a nick looks like, right? An adjacent phosphate and hydroxyl that is not engaged in a fossil diester bond. So what does ligase do? It seals this nick by forming that fossil diester bond. Okay. So ligase is as well. And we said ligase is J which gives us answer choice B. Okay. Uh, five, as of now, the only uh, process in central dogma that can be reversed is RNA to DNA. Uh, I really should say effectively reversed. Um, which of the following is a valid reason for why other processes in central dogma are unable to be effectively reversed? There we go. That's the proper language. Um, a, prokaryotic central dogma involves a spicism that cuts out introns and spices together exons, thus going backwards would result in an mRNA sequence that lacks intron sequences. Prokaryotic central dogma, does it involve a spicism? No, it does not. Okay. Does it cut out introns and spices together exons? No, it does not. That's eukaryotes, right? Prokaryotes do not have, most of them don't have introns, don't have a spicism because they lack a nucleus to be able to separate the transcription and translation machinery. So it doesn't work. B, eukaryotic central dogma involves post-transcriptional processing that splices together a specific sequence of exons, and thus going backwards would result in a pre-mRNA sequence that lacks introns and some exons. So remember, with our pre-mRNA, we have some sequence, say exon one, intron one, Exon 2, intron 2, exon 3. This here is our pre-mRNA. Okay, when we splice everything out, maybe we splice out intron 1 and intron 2, and maybe we also remove exon 2. So my final copy, my mature mRNA, will only have exon one and exon three, which means if I go backwards, right? So if I try to go from my mRNA back to my pre mRNA, I'd have a pre mRNA that only has, so if I were to go backwards, right? To my pre mRNA, I'd have a pre mRNA that has exon one and exon three. B, 
because there's no information encoded in here for exon 2 and the two introns. So your pre-mRNA would be lacking an exon and two introns. So that works. C, central dogma in both cases involves post-transcriptional processing that adds a five prime G cap and a three prime poly A tail that would be included in the mRNA sequence during the reverse transcription process. Well, the last part is true, right? If you were to do a reverse transcription, it, how should I word this? It would be included in the pre-mRNA sequence if you went backwards, but reverse transcription is not going pre-mRNA, or sorry, um, mature mRNA to pre-mRNA. Reverse transcription is RNA back to DNA. So it doesn't make sense by that logic, but also central dogma in both cases, it does not involve both, tra uh, both cases do not use post-transcriptional processing. It's just eukaryotes. So that gives us B as an answer. Six, the mRNA strand has the following sequence. I'm not going to bother reading that out. How many amino acids are encoded? You have a codon chart, but the only thing you need to look for is AUG and your stop codons, which are UAA, UAG, and crap. Oh, I got to look now. Hold on. Stop codons, UGA, UAA, UAG. Oh, UGA. That's the one I'm missing. Cool. So we scan along until we find an AUG. Perfect. There's our first AUG. And now we just... That establishes our reading frame, right? You only look for this. When figuring out where translation starts, you only look for your AUG. It doesn't matter where it is in regards to the five prime end. You just search for your first AUG. Okay, and then we move across. Keep going. Keep going. There's my UAA. That goes for one, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's eleven amino acids, and then the stop codon. Does the stop codon code for an amino acid? No. So would we say there's twelve amino acids encoded? No. We would just say eleven because the stop codon. doesn't code for an amino acid. Okay, which of the following statements correctly explains the different types of nucleic acids? Uh, a, there's no significant difference between RNA and DNA, and thus it was random chance in the chain of evolution that DNA was used instead of RNA for being the main source of genetic information. This is further proven by the existence of organisms that only have RNA. Fun fact, this is actually true. Some organisms do only have RNA, but there is a significant difference between RNA and DNA, right? If we look at the ribose sugar, DNA has one hydroxyl, RNA has two. This is a big difference. This is a major difference. This is what allows the cell to recognize a primer. It's not a little change, okay? So to say there's no difference is wrong. Uh, B, RNA is more easily separated from its double strand that, than DNA due to having two hydroxyl groups, one on each of the two prime and four prime carbons. There's no hydroxyl on the four prime carbon. It should be three prime carbons. So can this one be true? No. Uh, the, Let's see, uh, the rest of it says this allows transcription to occur more easily as less energy is required by RNA polymerase to separate the double-stranded RNA. Uh, the original version of this question, I made it a little bit easier. I did have the three prime carbon and the part that made it wrong was this allows transcription to occur more easily as less energy is required by RNA polymerase to separate the double-stranded RNA. Does transcription require double-stranded RNA? No. So originally I had three prime carbon here and then the part that made this wrong was this last sentence. RNA polymerase does not need to separate double-stranded RNA for transcription. Okay, so it's not B, which means it's not D, which means C has to be our answer, but we can go ahead and prove it to ourselves. RNA is less stable than DNA due to having two hydroxyl groups, one on each of the two prime and three prime carbons. That checks out. Um, Organisms want their long-term genetic material to be stable, otherwise their genetic material 
will degrade. So this is actually true. RNA as a single strand is um, less stable than DNA. And so it is more likely to degrade. Um, and remember, the DNA is your master copy. So if you start degrading your master copy by using RNA, the cell is going to be in trouble. Okay. Eight, you are a researcher attempting to understand DNA replication. You have two cells, each one treated with a specific substance and a containing a single linear chromosome. Okay. Alarm bell should be going off. DNA replication and a single linear chromosome. DNA replication, linear chromosome. DNA replication, linear chromosome. Hmm. I wonder what this question is asking. In one of the cells, nucleotide base information is missing at the end of a chromosome. Hmm. DNA replication, linear chromosome, DNA base information missing at the end. There's only one topic that discusses this in detail, and that's telomerase. All right? Remember, when telomerase is not function, or when telomerase does not function, it is no longer able to um, extend out that three prime overhang, which means you will have a loss of three prime. Right? So if we were to draw it out, oh my God, can we? Thank you. Right, so we have our primer, primer to lay down a primer here to synthesize this last little bit. Well, that's impossible. And so without telomerase, all of this would get cut out. Okay, so we're saying this happens. Well, why would this happen? It's because telomerase is not present. And that corresponds to E. Now, I could have also said this is a somatic cell. And which case nothing would be different. A normal somatic cell will have DNA nucleotide base information missing at the end of the linear chromosomes because somatic cells do not have telomerase present. But of course, we don't really want you to memorize that. Um, and so instead, you know, I'm telling you or I'm giving you the option of a non functioning telomerase. A, it says, cause the nucleotide substitution in the gene encoding helicase. If this were true, then helicase is probably no longer functioning, which means the, the strands wouldn't separate. Okay, has nothing to do with the end of the linear chromosome. B, cause a frame shift mutation in the gene encoding RNA polymerase. Okay, if this was the case, then you probably wouldn't get RNA polymerase, which means how is DNA replication occurring? <laughs> right? There's... There's no way DNA replication can occur if RNA polymerase is not functional because in order to get all the things you need for DNA replication, they're all proteins. So if your RNA polymerase is non-functional, you're not going to be able to get those proteins. Now, this is assuming that those proteins aren't already made. So if you've already made all the replicative proteins like DNA polymerase and then RNA polymerase is mutated, then you should, then you'll be totally fine at least for the first round and then they'll get to the actual cells and they'll all die because there's no proteins present. But if the replica, uh, the DNA replication proteins are already present, then you would be fine. But still it's not highlighting linear chromosome with base information missing at the end. C cause a nonsense mutation in ligase. Does ligase have anything to do with, DNA information missing at the end of a chromosome. No. <laughs> it has to do with having breaks in the backbone, right? Those nicks in the backbone. So let's not see. D, prevented DNA polymerase from folding properly. So now you have a non-functional DNA polymerase, which means you would just have no daughter strand, right? This specifically says just the ends of the chromosome has missing nucleotide information. Okay. The only thing that specifically talks about that is telomerase. 
A mutation occurs in the bacterial gene encoding one of the DNA polymerases that causes it to no longer function properly. What is the likely effect? So essentially what I'm doing with these sorts of questions is by introducing a null protein, aka a protein that doesn't work, I'm testing you on the functions of those proteins. So another way to ask this question is just straight up, what is the job of DNA polymerase? But what I'm doing is I'm adding another element to it by saying, instead of asking you, what is the job of DNA polymerase? I'm saying, what doesn't happen if DNA polymerase doesn't work? Okay. So A, DNA polymerase is unable to synthesize a primer. Does DNA, under normal conditions, does DNA polymerase synthesize a primer? It has nothing to do with that. Right? A mutation in DNA polymerase, a non-functional mutation, will have nothing to do with its ability to synthesize a primer. I mean, it's true it won't synthesize a primer, but it's not an effect, right? This is specifically asking you if I change DNA polymerase, what is an effect? DNA polymerase being unable to synthesize a primer is just true regardless. It's not as a result of this mutation. B, DNA polymerase is unable to connect the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand. Is that the job of DNA polymerase to connect the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand? Nope. C, DNA polymerase becomes more efficient at transcribing DNA. Does DNA polymerase transcribe DNA? Nope. So the final answer makes it D. Let's see, DNA polymerase is unable to catalyze phosphodiester bond formation between phosphate and hydroxyl groups, right? This is the job of DNA polymerase. When it's adding on nucleotides, what it's doing is it's catalyzing phosphodiester bond formation between the 5' prime phosphate of the incoming nucleotide and the 3' prime hydroxyl group. Uh, when comparing two cells, scientists often look at the proteins that are expressed. Cell so 1 and 2 have identical DNA sequences before being exposed to a toxin. Afterwards, one type of cell 1's proteins is notably, notably, no, no, oh notably shorter than the corresponding type of protein in cell 2. Hmm. So, I have two protein sequences. Cell 1 and cell 2. After toxin, I have my cell 1 sequence and I have my cell 2 sequence. Remember, these are proteins. These are primary structures. Well, what would cause my protein to be so much shorter? Well, this would be due to a premature Stop codon. Okay, right? So there was an error. All of a sudden, this at the end, instead of coding for another amino acid, is now coding for a stop codon. The ribosome comes across it, is like, oh, time to stop, and it stops prematurely. So we're looking for a premature stop codon, aka a nonsense mutation. Okay. A, cause a synonymous mutation in the mRNA transcript encoding this protein. Nope, not a synonymous mutation. And also, if it just occurred in the mRNA transcript, well, then you'd have maybe a few of cell of this type of protein for cell one being notably shorter, but we can just make more transcripts, right? RNA polymerase, there's multiple of them occurring in the cell. They can constantly be making more. And so if you have a mistake in one transcript, it's not the biggest deal in the world. B, cause a nonsense mutation in the DNA encoding this protein. This is what we at, this is what we talked about. Premature stop codon, aka nonsense mutation. C, caused a missense mutation in the DNA encoding this protein. Missense means one substitute one amino acid is substituted for another. And remember, stop codons are not amino acids, so we so saying a missense mutation is amino acid to a stop codon is not a thing, right? That's a nonsense mutation. So the answer is B. 
11. How do we define the relationship between light independent reactions and light dependent reactions? Well, light independent reactions, that's your Calvin cycle, right? Where CO2 enters along with ATP and NADPH, and we get glyceraldehyde. 3-phosphate, or G3P. Now the light dependent, aka your ETC slash photosystem, so your electron movement, movement, Ooh. this is what produces your ATP, and your NADPH. Okay. So we classify them as independent and dependent because they can happen independently of one another. Light independent reactions can occur without light dependent reactions occurring. Is this true? No. Remember, the products of light dependent reaction are the reactants for the light independent reactions. The products of the light independent reactions are the reactants for the light dependent reactions. They form a cycle, right? They're constantly exchanging reactants and products. Light independent reactions directly use light as a reactant. Nope, that's the light dependent reactions. So it's not B. C, light independent reactions do not directly use light, right? They don't use light, but instead rely on the products of light dependent reactions to drive light independent reactions. What it's saying is these, this re these reactions here don't require light, right? Don't directly require light. Re light is not entering the Calvin cycle at, at any stretch or at any point. Instead, light is entering into the light dependent reactions and it's producing ATP and NADPH but that ATP and NADPH goes into the light independent reactions. So that light was necessary for the light independent reactions to take place, but it's not a direct input. Instead, it's indirect, right? The direct input of light is into the light dependent reactions. D, although light independent reactions use light to directly drive the formation of glucose from CO2, it is absolutely necessary for the light... Hold on, wait. Although light independent reactions use light, oh, do light independent reactions use light to directly drive the formation of glucose? Nope. Indirectly. It's not D. 12. Which of the following statements are true? All errors in DNA are passed down to the next generation. If this were true, there would be so many errors in the genetic code to be ridiculous. Remember, errors can be fixed using what process? Proofreading. Okay. If it does not get fixed in proofreading, that's when it becomes a mutation. And then it has the possibility of getting passed down to the next generation. But all errors, nope, only some of them do. B, a ribosomal binding site would be absent in the gene encoding a tRNA molecule. This is true. Why? Well, a ribosomal binding site would be helpful for translation. If translation doesn't occur, like on a tRNA molecule, right, that tRNA molecule, its product or its, its job is to stay as a tRNA molecule. Its function in the cell is as an RNA molecule. So would it make sense to have a ribosomal binding site on it? No, because it doesn't need to be bound by the ribosome. An mRNA transcript that has the transcription termination site after the translation termination site will likely not result in a functioning gene product. What I was hoping here is you'd flip transcription and trip. Well, not hoping, but what I was trying to catch you on is trying to flip them. But really, this is 
it's not that it will not will likely not result in a functioning gene product. It is going to result in a functioning gene product, right? So we have the, uh, if we have the five prime end, the three prime end, if I have my, my translation termination here and my transcription termination here, then what will happen is my mRNA will be from here to here, which does include my translation termination, which means it will be translated just fine. It's when the translation termination occurs after the transcription termination that there might be issues in the cell, right? Because then the mRNA will not have a translation termination where it should, and it could result in a protein that's longer than it should be. Transcription requires the input of both DNTPs and NTPs. Nope. Just NTPs. You need NTPs and your DNA template. You also technically need um, your, oh, what's it called? The enzyme RNA polymerase. Anyways, you do not need DNTPs. So that makes B our only answer. 13, during the formation of a plant seed, the gene encoding ferrodoxin is mutated. Once again, this is exact. I'm asking you basically the, what is the purpose of ferrodoxin? To figure out what type of mutation took place, you compare the resulting damaged ferrodoxin against a known functioning ferrodoxin from another plant. The diagram to the right shows the role of a functioning ferrodoxin. So the goal of ferrodoxin, right, is to regulate cyclic versus non-cyclic. Okay. So then we look at the primary structures of the normal normal and mutant proteins let's look at the normal protein we just have this long blue sequence and this is the normal primary structure perfect if we look at the mutant hmm about halfway through all of a sudden we get a mutant primary structure so everything in the first half is just fine i guess i should have wrote n and c here so that's my fault I'll add that to my next variation of this question. I made it at like 1 a.m. Give me a break. Anyways, N on the left side, C on the right side. Now we can see, hmm, we go from normal all of, all of a sudden to a divergence point. All the nucleotides past this do not match the normal primary structure, or all the amino acids past this do not match the normal primary structure, meaning that somehow all the codons got jumbled. And what's the best way this can occur? A frame shift mutation. Oh, what's happening? What's happening? That was odd. Okay. Anyways, a frame shift mutation, right? We're changing what the frame is, the reading frame, and that's causing different nucleotides to be read in a group of three. Okay. So what type of mutation likely occurred? Should be a frame shift and how may the plant be affected? Well, what do we think? A protein that has half of its um, uh, primary structure completely different? I'm going to guess this thing is not going to function very well. Let's see. A missense mutation occurred not affecting the plant. That's not neither of those. B, a frame shift mutation occur. Okay, that works. Resulting in a plant that is unable to produce carbon compounds. Hmm. That makes sense, right? If ferrodoxin is no longer functioning would it be able to return its electrons back to or would it even be able to get its electrons in the first place probably not and if it did do we think it's going to be able to give its electrons to plastic uh, plastiquinone which is pq or nadp plus reductase probably not which means you're not going to be able to generate the atp or the nadph you need for calvin fix or carbon fixation C, a nonsense mutation occurred. It's not a nonsense mutation. We still have a primary structure sequence. It's just different. 
right? This is not saying that the sequence is gone. That would be if we had something that looks like that, where this was the primary structure sequence. Instead, we have the mutant one actually being longer, so that suggests there's actually an insertion. So there was an insertion of a few nucleotides here that lengthened this primary structure. I guess technically you could have a deletion do that as well. I'm just talking technicalities. Anyways, uh, the mutant uh, primary structure is longer. It's not shorter, so it couldn't be a nonsense mutation. But even then, resulting in a plant that is unable to produce ADP for the Calvin cycle, does the light-dependent reactions produce ADP for the Calvin cycle? Nope, it produces ATP. D, a three-nucleotide insertion occurred. Okay, that does match what I said. It's maybe a frame shift, but guess what? A three-nucleotide insertion is actually not a frame shift because all you've done, right? Remember, a frame shift is you have your group of three... These are what you read. And so if I just stick another group of three in here, there's no frame shift that occurs. If I were to stick one or two or four or five or seven or eight, I would have a frame shift. But if I stick three, six, nine, any multiple of three, there won't be a frame shift occurring. Okay, E, a silent mutation occurred. Nope. We quite literally see a different primary structure. A silent mutation is where one amino acid gets changed for the exact same amino acid. All that's changed is the codon. But remember, multiple codons can code for the same amino acid. So if you change one codon that changes, let's say, for serine, or co codes for serine, and you change that codon into a different codon that still codes for serine, well, you've mutated a spot in the DNA, but it has no effect because they both still code for serine. Okay. 14, DNA is composed of four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, when comparing the impacts of complementary base pair interactions. What the heck? Hold on. I just heard my door open. <laughs> Wait a minute. Nope. Never mind. I'm tripping. <laughs> I thought my garage door opened and I was like, oh my God, am I about to get murdered? Anyways, I think I should probably go to bed soon. Uh, when comparing the inner impacts of complementary base pair interactions, we find that GC contribute more to the stability of DNA than A and T. Hmm. If G, the GC interaction is contributing contributing more to the stability of DNA than A T than A to T, well, that likely means there's more interactions taking place, right? Remember, more interactions tend to be more stable. So the GC interaction or the ba GC base pairing has more interactions than A and T. Now you could memorize that G and C have three um, hydrogen bonds between them versus A and T has two, but you actually did not need to memorize that for this question, right? By setting it up for you, I was testing you on, do you remember your stability rules and why interactions exist? Okay, so when delicase unzips DNA, what interactions are broken? It's the H bonds between complementary bases. So it's not C, it's not D, it's not E. We're only dealing with hydrogen bonds. And more bonds are broken between G and C because there's more interactions taking place here, which is why that GC interaction is contributing more to the stability than, uh, um, of the DNA than A and T. 15. How can we tell the difference between RNA and DNA in any cell? What this means is this could be prokaryotes. Could be eukaryotes. It could be plants, animals. It could be anything. 
Okay. A says DNA is solely found in the nucleus. Well, if that were true, then prokaryotes don't have DNA. Because prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. So A is wrong. B, DNA uses thymine. RNA uses uracil. This is true. This is something we need you to know. C, DNA has an extra hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. RNA does not. Hold on, wait. Am I tripping? Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, I'm tired. Anyways, DNA has an extra hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. RNA does not. No, that's not true. RNA has an extra hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. DNA does not. What I was tripping about is I forgot that for D, I was like, isn't D correct? But it's <laughs> RNA has an extra carboxyl group on the two prime carbon. DNA does not. If this had said hydroxyl group, it would be true, but it's not a carboxyl group. It's a hydroxyl group. Okay. <laughs> when I get tripped up by my own question, because it's almost 2 a.m. Anyways, cytochrome C oxidase, otherwise known as complex four, is the final complex in the human cellular respiration electronic electron transport chain. Under normal conditions, it reduces O2 to H2O. During DNA replication, DNA polymerase makes a single substitution error, resulting in a missense mutation in an exon on the cytochrome C oxidase gene that prevents the binding of O2. So in other words... The final reaction in the ETC, where you have complex 4, O2 going to H2O with the electrons. This reaction does not happen. O2 cannot bind to complex 4, so there's not going to be any reaction taking place. This altered sequence is then passed down to a daughter cell. Which of the following would we expect to observe when we compare the daughter cell to other cells under different conditions in the short term? Okay, A, the daughter cell will produce more lactic acid than a non-mutated cell in normal conditions. Well, let's logic ourselves through why this is the case. Or let, let's see if this is true. Um, if it's not binding to O2, what's going to So if O2 is not binding to complex 4, what's going to happen to the ETC? Well, the ETC is going to stop because the terminal electron acceptor is no longer able to accept electrons. So the electrons are going to get piled up on complex four and get piled all the way through. And when the ETC stops, you got an issue. How do we solve said issue? Fermentation, right? Regenerate that NAD plus pools. And in humans, we produce, or when we ferment, we produce lactic acid. So the daughter cell that has this mutation should produce more lactic acid than a non-mutated cell in normal conditions, right? A non-mutated cell in normal conditions means this cell is able to, one, have oxygen present in its environment, and two, it's able to bind oxygen to complex four to keep the ETC running. So A, A is true. B, the daughter cell will act in a similar manner to a non-mutated cell that is in a cyanide-rich environment. And I even told you, cyanide binds to cytochrome C instead of O2. So instead of uh, O2 binding to cytochrome C, cyanide binds to cytochrome C. And when cytochrome C is not able to... Um, Ooh, cyanide binds to cytochrome C oxidase. Whatever. Um, is it? Wait, no. Is it cytochrome C? Crap. I don't remember. I'm going to go with cytochrome C because that's what I wrote at the time. And I wrote this in a much better condition than I am now. Anyways, I need coffee. Um... If it binds to cytochrome C, yeah, no, sorry, this should say cytochrome C oxidase. My bad. Because it's O2. 
All right, so if O2 is not able to bind to complex four because a cyanide has bound to it as well, well, you're going to run into the same issue, right? The electron transport chain breaks down. This is why cyanide is such a big deal is because it binds to that complex four, prevents respiration to occur from occurring, cell must undergo fermentation, and that only lasts so long before the cells start to die. So they will act in a similar manner, right? They will both undergo a fermentative pathway. C, the daughter cell will be unable to produce ATP. Well, yes, it would be unable to produce ATP from the ETC, but it can still produce ATP from glycolysis. D, there will be no difference between the daughter cell and a non-mutated cell in normal conditions. That's not true, right? We know one's going to undergo fermentation. So our answer is E. Which of the following statements follows what we know to be true about replication and transcription? A, they both use the same enzymes, except DNA polymerase and replication is substituted by RNA polymerase and transcription. I mean, it's almost true, except... DNA polymerase or DNA replication also uses helicase, primase, and ligase, all of which are absent in transcription. B, the overall polymerization reactions for both replication and transcription are exergonic. That is true. Replication uses strictly ATP as an energy source. Nope. It uses DNTPs, whereas transcription uses strictly GTP as an energy source. Nope. It uses NTPs. C, the overall polymerization reactions for replication and transcription are exergonic. Replication and transcription both use the energy harvested from breaking apart phospho and hydride bonds in respective precursor molecules, right? This is referring to the phosphoanhydride bonds in the DNTPs and the NTPs. Okay. D, the overall polymerization reactions for both replication and transcription are endergonic. If this was the case, what is the whole point of coupling reactions together if it's just going to be endergonic, right? Remember, we want effective coupling to take place. Now, this gets worse by saying, as a result, cells use the exergonic nature of breaking apart phosphodiester bonds to couple to the endergonic reaction that is forming phosphoanhydride bonds. This is the opposite of what we want in replication and transcription. We want to break phosphoanhydride bonds to make phosphodiester bonds. So basically, everything in D is wrong. 18. Examine... The two amino acids below, the binding domain of DNA polymerase, where it binds to the DNA, contains many polar amino acids. Unfortunately, a single ribosome was watching YouTube instead of paying attention to translation, accidentally making a mistake, which results in a switch from amino acid A to amino acid B in the binding domain. Which of the following is true? Note, the pH of the cell is approximately 7. Okay, so this is a good question for identifying what is the actual important parts. Because... The pH and pKa is actually completely irrelevant to this question. Yes, this one will be negatively charged. This one will be neutral. And it will be nonpolar. And so, for this protein, this single protein that has this mistake taking place, it will likely be non-functional but guess what how many proteins do we think are getting made in transcription and translation probably a lot right think about it if you have from a single gene gene you can get multiple transcripts and each of these transcripts can be made into multiple proteins. Wink, wink. This looks exactly like your discussion manual. 
And so what this saying is a single ribosome makes a mistake. So one out of how many did I draw here? Six, 12, 18, 24. One out of 24 is a mistake. On the grand scale, and that's the key thing I want you to, guys to take into account, is when you're making proteins, you're going to be making a lot of them. So if you have one mistake, it's really not going to impact it that much. Okay. Now, if this were to occur in the DNA, it would be a lot more big of a, oh my God, a lot bigger of a deal, right? Because then every single protein, if the mistake occurs in the DNA, if there's a mutation in the DNA, every single protein will have that error, will have that mutation. 19, this prokaryotic gene encodes for a very basic protein. What is its amino acid sequence? All right, let's identify. We have a protein. A protein. Oh, my God. Promoter. On my left, three prime. On my right, five prime for this top strand. So it's going three prime to five prime with my promoter on the left. That makes this. All right, say it with me. Template or coding. It is three, two, one. The template strand. Because RNA polymerase will start here and move this way. And what is it doing? It's reading three prime to five prime, right? That's what it's reading, which makes this top strand the template strand because that's the strand it's actually reading. Okay, so what does that mean? It means we get to transcribe this. So A goes to T, A goes to U. Uh, T goes to A, G, oh God, this is going to be horrible to write. Hold on. Let me zoom in. Oh, I don't remember what this looks like. Hold on. I hate myself for making a question like this. <laughs> A, U, A, C, G, C, C, A, U, oop. G, A, G, C, U, A, C, C, U, C, G, A, U, <sighs> it's never ending, G, <laughs> okay, there we go. And now what we do to translate this, we just got to hunt for our AUG. Remember, your AUG is what determines your stop codon or your start codon. That's your, Well, it is your start codon, and that determines where translation starts and what your reading frame is. So it doesn't matter what all of this is, right? This is like your five prime or your binding site for the ribosome. It's going to be part of the, what we call the five prime UTR. Don't worry about it. But... We look for that AUG, it doesn't matter where it is in regards to the phi prime end, and we start from there. So it'll be AUG, then AAG, CUA, GUU, UGC, CUG, and UAG, which I know that as a stop codon. Okay. First off, I can cancel this guy out because we never include stop. And I have aug. It always starts with methionine, so that works. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool. You can also go through and using the amino acid chart at the back of the exam, you can go through and find the correct sequence. I just happened to make it easy on you and didn't give you... Um, sequences that were the same length <laughs> because I'm incredibly nice. If you guys couldn't tell anyways, the coding strand is as follows. What is the MRNA sequence that results from transcription? All right. So how do we go from coding strand to MRNA? Do we use complementary base pairing rules? Nope. We just substitute all the T's for U's. To go template to mRNA, that's where we use complementary rules.
but going coding to mRNA. Also, I should say anti-parallel rules. Parallel. I don't know if I spelled that correctly. I don't care. No, it has one at R. Wait. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm so tired. Anyways, so all we need to do is we need to change this, keep everything the same, except we substitute use in for all the T's, which corresponds to B. Okay, below list possible sites to include in a complete genetic sequence. Write the sites that are necessary and in the correct order in the DNA for a gene product that is destined to transport glucose in the side of the cell. What thing did we learn that transport glucose inside the cell? A protein, which means this needs to be transcribed and translated. So if we look at our gene, we should have our promoter. Then we should have our transcription start. Then our translation start. Sorry, wait. Transcription start, then ribosomal binding site. And then translation start. Right? First, we're binding RNA polymerase. Then we're getting our transcript. And the first thing in our transcript needs to be our ribosomal binding site. Then we can start translating. Then we're going to have our open reading frame. That's our protein coding sequence. Then we need to stop translating. And then we can stop transcription. And that'll code for answer choice D. 22, examine the diagram to the right. Which of the following statements is true? So here is our phosphate group. Is that five prime or three prime? Say it with me. It's five prime. C is talking about the hydroxyl group. That is the three prime. B is a nitrogenous base. And D is an incoming. It has a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. So it's an NTP. A represents the three prime end. No, it does not. <laughs> we just said A represents the five prime end. B, B can hydrogen bond. Yes, it can, right? That's how these nitrogenous bases work. They can hydrogen bond. C is involved in an enzyme catalyzed reaction. What enzyme catalyzed reaction is it involved in? Polymerization via which enzyme? RNA polymerase. Um, and D is an energy source for the cell, right? We can break apart these bonds and use that energy that was stored in those bonds to form new bonds. C, A represents the five prime end. That is in fact true. B is a phosphate group. B is not a phosphate group. It's a nitrogenous base. D, A is a five prime end. Yes, it is. C is the three prime end. Yes. And D is attached to the polymer by DNA polymerase. Nope. This is an RNA nucleotide, so it would not be attached by DNA polymerase. It would be attached by RNA polymerase or primase. Which of the following processes do not require a template? DNA replication does. It uses parent strands to make the daughter strands. Telomere elongation by telomerase. It has its own telomere internal RNA sequence that it uses as a template to extend the three prime overhang. So it does. C, addition of a poly A tail to a eukaryotic pre mRNA. All that's happening is you take a poly polyadenylate polymerase, aka a, a, a polymerase that all it does is it adds um, adenine. That's all it's doing to a pre mRNA. But if we didn't know that, we do know that the addition of amino acids to a peptide chain in the ribosome does require a template, aka the mRNA. So it does require a template and transcription does require a template. In fact, we call the strand that we read the template strand. 24, which of the following is incorrect regarding the nature of DNA replication? 
Ligase is more active on the lagging strand than the leading strand. This is true. Right? It is more active on the lagging strand than the leading strand. Because the lagging strand has all those Okazaki fragments that have to be um, connected together. B, Ligase is more active on the leading strand than the lagging strand? This is false. Ligase has one job on the leading strand, and that's getting rid of one primer, right? Or attaching one primer to the strand. The lagging strand has like a million primers. Not a million, but you know what I mean, right? It has a lot of primers that need to get removed. So B is wrong. C, DNA polymerase can remove nucleotides that it incorrectly adds to the daughter strand. AKA proofreading. Okay, so C is true. D, helicase breaks hydrogen bonds between complementary base pairs. That's what we mean by unzipping. E, DNA polymerase requires a three prime hydroxyl to perform its function. That is true. That's why initially it requires a primer, which is why primase exists. 25 DNA. Oh my God, we're so, so close to being done. DNA polymerase makes an error in replication that it does not detect nor fix, aka a mutation. This results in a nonsense mutation. What happens when RNA polymerase reads this mutation? <coughs> Cough aside, absolutely dirt nothing. A nonsense mutation implies that it's a mutation involving an amino acid, which means it's occurring inside the open reading frame, which means that RNA polymerase, or it has nothing to do with the transcription machinery or the translation machinery, right? okay? So would transcription stop? Stop, or would transcription stop? No. A nonsense mutation causes premature stopping in translation, not transcription. RNA polymerase deals with transcription. B, translation stops. Well, yes, if we were asking about the ribosome. RNA polymerase would not stop translating. It was never translating in the first place. Replication stops. Well, why would replication stop if we're asking what RNA polymerase is doing? Right? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Same thing, right? RNA polymerase does not is not actively involved in replication. RNA polymerase is unaffected. This is true, right? RNA polymerase, it reads that mutation and it doesn't sense it as a mutation. It's just another base pair. It's just what RNA polymerase is doing is it finds the base pair or it reads the sequence. Hey, it's a guanine. I need to stick a cytosine on my daughter strand or on my um, growing RNA sequence. That's all it's doing. 26. The diagram to the right depicts transcription via RNA polymerase, aka the blue box. So here's my RNA polymerase and translation via ribosome. So here's my ribosome. Right? Ribo is ribosome supposed to. Why am I blinking? Oh, wait, I did write it. God, dude. My brain is fried. Uh, Yeah, ribosome. Oh, that's why. I spelled it with a Z. Okay. Happen so the key here is transcription and translation are happening synchronously. Meaning that the translation machinery and the transcription machinery are happening in the same exact place. That is only possible when there's no nucleus. And this is only present in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes have a nucleus. That's is what allows them to keep this processes separate. Which means that we can do post-transcriptional modifications or post-transcriptional processing. But to have them happening at the same time, it must be a prokaryote. 
Okay. The diagram to the right shows a mature mRNA base pairing with its original DNA template strand. A and B are loops where there is no complementary sequence between the mRNA and DNA. These loops are present on the blank strand and represent blank sequences. The first thing, mature mRNA. That tells us we're in a eukaryote because we have pre-mRNA and we have mature mRNA. Okay. Now, what would be causing these loops? Because, right, if we go from DNA to an mRNA, it should be the exact same information, right? Well, yes, but remember... In eukaryotes, you have introns. And these introns get cut out. So you will have introns in the DNA, but not in the mRNA. So all these loops here are the introns. So all this extra DNA here, this is your intron. Now, should this be present in the DNA? It should. Right? It's in the DNA. These introns are in the DNA. Now, why is it not the promoter? Well, why would we have the promoter in the middle of an mRNA strand and have two of them? Right? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense because somehow this mRNA strand would be spanning two different promoters and the promoters are, they break up the strand. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? The promoter should be at the very, very end. And there just shouldn't be any mRNA near that. So the DNA, if this were the promoter, what we'd have is we'd have the DNA. And then that would be our mRNA. Right, it would be much shorter where this here is our promoter. So it only works with introns. 28. A cell is preparing to undergo DNA replication. How do we predict glucose 6-phosphate to be metabolized during this time? What do you need for DNA replication? You need DNTPs, which means you need nucleotides. Which means you need nucleotide biosynthesis, and we learned one pathway that feeds into that, and that's the pentose phosphate pathway. And what is an input of the pentose phosphate pathway? Glucose 6-phosphate, which also happens to be an input of glycolysis. Well, glycolysis produces ATP, which is going to be necessary for DNA replication. And think about it, in order to go from the pentose phosphate pathway where we have our ribose 5-phosphates, to nucleotides, we're going to need some ATP input in order to get those single phosphate sugars to a triphosphate sugar. Okay, so we're going to need some energy, which means we will need glycolysis to occur for cellular respiration, but we also need the pentose phosphate pathway to occur. So we need both. And what that means is the cell needs to regulate, right? This is a branch point. We're going to have some going, some glucose 6-phosphate going into glycolysis and others going into the pentose phosphate pathway, right? It's a regulation. It's a balance between the two. If we had all going into the pentose phosphate pathway, we wouldn't get any ATP that we need for all the other processes. If it all went into glycolysis, we would not be able to make our nucleotides. It was all converted to glycogen for long-term storage. Well, then you get neither ATP nor <laughs> your nucleotides. E, it would be impossible to predict how glucose 6-phosphate will be metabolized. Well, no, we can predict it, right? We need both of these. We need both ATP and we need nucleotides. 29 below is a snapshot of gene BIS2A with and without a regulatory molecule green RM present. So the black arrow represents whether or not transcription will occur and the blue transcription factor is a protein transcription factor regulating BIS2A. From this diagram, we can conclude that. Well, let's see. When the blue transcription factor is bound to the promoter, we do not get transcription. So 
the blue TF is a negative regulator. And let's see, when the green regulatory molecule is bounded to the transcription factor, we do get transcription, which means that the green RM is turning off the transcription factor. Okay. All right. So let's see a mutation in the gene that encodes the blue transcription factor and results in a protein. So a mutation in a gene that encodes the blue transcription factor. Okay. So a mutation in the gene that encodes this blue transcription factor and results in a protein that cannot bind to the green regulatory molecule will increase transcription of bis 2 a Well, if it can't bind to the green regulatory molecule, what that says is there's no way to turn off our blue transcription factor. And whenever we cannot turn a blue transcription factor off, that means it's on, which means we do not get transcription of bis 2 a So it's not A. B, a mutation in the red promoter that decreases RNA polymerase binding affinity will cause an increase in transcription of bis 2 a If we decrease the RNA polymerase binding affinity, what we're saying is RNA polymerase and the promoter do not associate with each with each other with a, um, a high amount, right? So they're, they don't have a strong attraction or affinity for each other. They don't bind to each other that often. And so by decreasing their affinity, what we're saying is we're decreasing how much they bind to each other. And without RNA polymerase binding to the promoter, there's no transcription. So it should not increase transcription of bis 2 a C, a mutation in the gene that encodes the blue transcription factor and results in a blue transcription factor that cannot bind to the red promoter will increase transcription of bis 2 a What this is saying is our transcription factor can no longer bind to our promoter. And what we see is when the transcription factor cannot bind to the promoter, we get transcription. So C is correct. D, a mutation in the red promoter that decreases blue transcription binding affinity to the promoter will cause a decrease in transcription of bis 2 a This is effectively doing the same thing as C, right? What we're saying is the blue transcription factor won't be able to bind to the promoter as well. And when it doesn't bind to the promoter, we get transcription. So we should have an increase in transcription of bis 2 a not a decrease. E, an increase in the concentration of green RM in the cell will, inc will result in a decrease in transcription of bis2a. Well, if we increase the or the concentration of green RM in the cell, what we're saying is this blue transcription factor is more likely to be bound to the regulatory molecule, meaning it's more likely to be turned off, which means we should get more transcription. All right, 30, the evolution of photosystem 2 was an important step in the development of modern plant cells. This allowed cells to utilize H2 as an electron source. Nope. The evolution of photosystem 2 uses H2O as an electron source. B, utilize H2 as an electron acceptor. Nope. It's an electron donor. C, utilize H2 as an electron donor. Okay, getting better. The resulting light-dependent reactions could either make ATP or NADPH at one time. This is not true. Remember, with the addition of two photosystems, a cell was able to make ATP and NADPH Um, at the same time, right? That's why this was so big is you could use water as the source, which was abundant. And now you can make both ATP and NADPH at the same time by being able to do cyclic and non-cyclic at the same time. And your non-cyclic produces proton motor force that you can then use to make ATP. So it's not one at a time. It's both at the same time. D, utilize H2 as an electron donor. The resulting Z scheme could generate both ATP and NADPH when undergoing non-cyclic photophosphorylation. This is true, right? 
it can generate both ATP and NADPH at the same time when it's undergoing that non-cyclic. Because the first part, aka the ETC that connects photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, that generates your proton motor force that gives you... Um, actually, hold on. Aha! Photosystem... This is mislabeled. I just realized that. That should be photosystem 2. That should be photosystem 1. Whoopsies. Oh, well. Anyways. Um, oh, God. That's that's embarrassing. Oh, well. Anyways. Um, this part will generate the proton motor force. And then this part will give you your NADPH. So you can get both occurring at the same time. Finally, E, utilize O2 as an electron donor. Nope. That's not how photosystem 2 works. So our answer is D. All righty. Um, that's my practice midterm. Of course, if you guys have any questions, you can always shoot me a message. I will try my best to respond. Um, best of luck studying. You guys got this. And... Uh, yeah, good luck on your finals as well. That's coming up.